At 19, Kazuya Suma was suddenly left without family after the passing of his grandfather. However, he is soon transported to Elfrieden Kingdom, a kingdom in another realm that is facing a great challenge against the demonic army. Despite being summoned as a mere offering, Kazuya determines to do more than fulfill his role as a tribute. He instead chooses to help revive the kingdom's struggling economy through administrative reform instead of embarking on adventures or warfare. Eventually, he unexpectedly becomes the king of Elfrieden and even engaged to the princess. With the help of a group of skilled individuals, he takes on the bureaucracy and works hard to rejuvenate the nation, earning the title of the realist hero. The story begins with the protagonist, Kazuya, receiving words of advice from his grandfather. His grandfather lets him know that family is very important because you tend to find fulfillment in the family. They have lost Kazuya's mother and Kazuya's grandmother, who is left of the family, is Kazuya and his grandfather. His grandfather encourages him to start a family once he is gone. Not long after Kazuya's grandfather said these words, he passed on too. With this, only Kazuya is left in the family. Elsewhere, in the world of fantasy, a kingdom is going through a hard time. They decide that the only solution they have is to summon a hero that would help them. They prepare everything they need to carry out the summoning ritual. Kazuya is in the library, studying when a portal opens and transports him to the world of fantasy. He finds himself staring at some priests who could not believe that the summoning ritual actually worked. Kazuya is taken to the king. The king thanks him for answering their call, but Kazuya protests and says he was brought here without his permission. Kazuya tells the king that he is ready to hear what he has to say before losing his temper. The king explains to him that the world is a supercontinent called Landia. The continent is home to many races including humans, elves, dwarves, and dragon newts. There are several diverse countries on the continent. Ten years ago, a rift known as the Demon Realm appeared in the continent's northern part. Monsters trooped out and caused chaos in the northern region. The closest to the Demon Realm is the Grand Chaos Empire. Together, various nations supported them to assemble a strike force and mounted an invasion against the Demon Realm. However, the invasion failed, and this caused the nations the bulk of their military resources. The nations no longer have the strength to repel the demon's forces, and this has led to the demon occupying a third of the continent. After bringing Kazuya up to speed about what happened, Kazuya is informed that they are supposed to send payments to the Grand Chaos Empire for support against their fight against the Demon Realm. However, they are poor at the moment, and there is even a shortage of food in the country. They decided to summon a hero, whom they will send to the Empire as their payment. Lest I forget, the name of the kingdom that summoned Kazuya is called the Elfrieden Kingdom, and the name of the king is Albert Elfrieden. Kazuya then asks the king who a hero is. The Prime Minister Marx answers that a hero is someone who will lead the revolution into a new age. Kazuya cannot believe what his ears are hearing or what his eyes are seeing. He thought about escaping but realizes that it will be a grave mistake if they catch him. Moreover, how does he even want to escape and return back to Japan without their help? Kazuya then asks them if they are able to summon heroes frequently but they say no. The last time they summoned a hero was 500 years ago. Upon hearing this, Kazuya makes them realize that he is the country's trump card and they would not want to throw him away just like that. He offers to help them review the country's finances and build up national strength. After days of consecutive meetings and planning with Kazuya, the king calls for a conference. Albert informs everyone that he is hereby abdicating the throne for Kazuya. He is also engaging his daughter, Lishia, with Kazuya. Everyone, including Kazuya, was surprised when the king announced this. The news is then passed to the other dukedoms that the transfer of power has taken effect immediately. Upon hearing this, Lishia leaves the army and rushes home immediately to challenge her parents for not consulting her before announcing her engagement. Lycia also believes that the throne was usurped, but her father assures her that it was of his own free will. Albert tells Lycia to go and see Kazuya, so that they can discuss their engagement further. Lycia finds Kazuya in his office where he is busy going through a bulk load of paperwork. After a short discussion, Kazuya tells Lycia that he doesn't have the intention of keeping the throne. His aim is to work for a few years and step down. He also tells Lycia that she is free to cancel their engagement. To make things interesting, Kazuya says he has secured the funding that they need to send to the empire for assistance. Kazuya grouped the country's treasures into three. The very valuable ones will be kept in the museum where people will come to see them. The second group is sold off to acquire funds. The third group is the magical items, and Kazuya deems them as weapons that should not be misplaced carelessly. However, he is not sending the aid money to the empire until the last day. Kazuya also informs Lycia that he needs to work on the country's food shortage. Up next, 
one of the priests comes to tell Kazuya that he needs to do a magic test. Their previous hero was able to practice magic, and they need to know if Kazuya has that ability too. He is taken to a room, where he is told to touch a piece of artifact. If he sees a bright light, that means he has an affinity for magic. Kazuya touches the artifact and finds out that he can use magic. Later on, Kazuya starts to use his magic to copy three autonomous consciousnesses of himself to help him go through paperwork and do other things. Kazuya decides to name the consciousness, the living poltergeist. With this, Kazuya's productivity has increased. Kazuya tells Lysia that he is trying to find untapped money. This might come from nobles that have requested excess funding for some projects that they are in charge of. Kazuya and his officials go through a load of paperwork, and the rest of the group, including Lysia, gets exhausted and sleeps. The following morning, Lysia wakes up to Kazuya petting her head while she sleeps. Kazuya tells Lysia that he is all done with his current task. He asks if Lysia will go home by now but she says no. She urges Kazuya to try and get some rest since he didn't sleep over the night. Kazuya says he plans to get a lot of sleep later, but there is something that he needs to attend to. He asks Lysia to follow him because there is something he needs to show her. The duo gets on a horse and starts riding to some place known only to Kazuya. On their way, Lysia asks if Kazuya has anyone that might be missing him in his past lives, but he says no. Lysia stylishly asks if Kazuya has a girlfriend also, but he says no. Kazuya says, he is not in a hurry to return because there is no one waiting for him back home. Shortly afterward, they get to a cotton field. Kazuya then tells Lysia that the inedible field is the reason for the shortage of food in the country. The country has gone more into commercial crops than crops that will provide food. The county has done this because of the money they get from exporting cotton that they have abandoned the primary crops to plant for food. The country started having a financial crisis when other countries also joined in producing commercial crops. This has reduced the demand for cotton from Elfrieden. Elfrieden no longer has the capacity to keep importing food crops, and this is what has caused the food shortage and financial instability in the country. Lucia is ashamed of herself for not knowing something like this, but Kazuya tells her not to be harsh on herself. Kazuya tells Lysia that she will one day be in charge of the country after he leaves. This is the reason he is showing her everything she needs to know to run the country smoothly. Up next, Kazuya and Lysia are seen eating in the same hall with other castle workers and guards. Kazuya lets Lysia know that the country cannot afford extravagant meals at the moment. He also tells Lysia that they will soon start agricultural reforms to boost the kingdom's economy and tackle food shortage. While they are eating, the captain of the royal guard, Sir Ludwin Arx, passes by and Lysia introduces him to Kazuya. Arx asks Kazuya if the reforms are going smoothly, but he says no. Kazuya says all the officials he is working with are currently old. He needs a young and vibrant retainer to assist him. Lysia suggests that Kazuya makes use of the crystal cast to recruit a retainer. The crystal cast is a holographic projector that allows the citizens to watch an event happening in the palace. Kazuya then uses uses the crystal cast to send a message to all the citizens and tribes in the kingdom. He tells them that he needs anyone who is talented to work with him as his retainer. He urges them not to think any of their talents are useless. After hearing this, some of the citizens prepare themselves to go to the capital and show the king what they are capable of. Later on, it is revealed that the people of the fantasy world do not understand Japanese, but Kazuya understands their language because he has the knowledge imbibed in him during the summoning ritual. Up next, Lysia is reminiscing in her room about everything Kazuya told her. She is troubled that Kazuya is willing to end the engagement if she agrees to it. Kazuya also has a plan to return to Japan once he is done. Lysia starts thinking of starting a family with Kazuya to hold him down and prevent him from going back to Japan. Lysia has come to the realization that no one is more capable of leading the county than Kazuya. Shortly afterward, Lysia's maid comes in to tell her that the king is hosting a ceremony to honor those who are outstanding among those he recruited. Among the plenty that volunteered, a few have been selected, and the king will be receiving them today. Soon afterward, the ceremony begins, and the event is also broadcasted throughout the kingdom using the crystal cast. The first candidate to be presented to the king is Lady Aisha Udgard, a dark elf of the sacred forest. Kazuya makes use of the living poltergeist to quickly read about the elves. The elves are known for their military prowess, and Aisha is their best. Aisha lets the king know that she does not respect him yet. She then puts forward the problem they are facing in their forest. They are facing a crisis of tree thinning, 
and a lack of new growth. Kazuya explains to her that the older trees is the reason new trees are growing. Their crowns have overshadowed the younger trees. Kazuya advises they should try and get rid of the old tree to leave room for the new ones. Upon hearing this, Aisha bows down and pledges her loyalty to Kazuya. She lets him know that she is ready to do anything that he commands of her, because he is blessed with a great knowledge. Next to come forward is Lady Juna Doma. Juna is blessed with beauty and a good singing voice. Kazuya then asks her to sing a beautiful song for the people to hear. Kazuya plays a tune for her with his mobile phone. After hearing the tune, Juna sings a heartwarming song that everyone including Kazuya enjoys. After Juna, Sir Poncho Panacotta of Pata Village is called to the throne. Poncho is a fat man who has the alleged gift of gluttony. He is said to have tasted all the foods in the kingdom. Kazuya hears this and says, Poncho is exactly who he needs because his expertise will come when it comes to dishes. The whole nation was surprised when the king received Poncho with a warm heart. They believe that for someone like Poncho to have made the cut, most of them also have talents that would be useful to Kazuya. Sir Hakuya Kwanman is the next to be called to the throne. It is believed that his knowledge and memory are unrivaled in the kingdom. Kazuya asks Hakuya what genre of books he reads and he says, there is no preference for him. The king offers him the job of being a librarian in the castle library, but Hakuya humbly rejects the offer. Hakuya says he would like to use knowledge to help the king. He wants to be his retainer. Hakuya says he has judged Kazuya's wisdom and realized that he is a worthy ruler. His decision to take Poncho in is a sign that he doesn't discriminate. Hakuya points out that Poncho might not be useful for the king at the moment, but he intentionally took him under his wings in case there is a need for him in the future. With this, Kazuya tells Hakuya to pay a visit to his chambers later. It is revealed that Hakuya would later go on to be Kazuya's prime minister. He will be termed the prime minister in black. Finally, Lady Tomo Inui of the Mystic Wolves is called upon. She has the ability to understand beasts and animals. The animals also understand her too. Kazuya learns that there are no mystic wolves living in the kingdom, and there is a possibility that she is a refugee. The king says he is willing to keep to his promise of hearing everything that the candidates have to offer. Tomoe then calls the king closer and says something in his ear. The king looks a little scared, but doesn't show it when he hears what Tomoe has to say. After the event, Kazuya takes Tomoe to his office to see her. He asks his officials if they heard what Tomoe said to him, but they said no. This made Kazuya relax that no one could have heard the conversation through the crystal cast too. Kazuya reveals that Tomoe spoke to a demon, and it understood her. Tomoe describes the demon and says it has the face of a dog. She says the dog looked like a scout from the demon lord's army. Tomoe was picking vegetables in the forest when she came across the demon. The demon told her to run away from the area because she is in danger. Upon hearing this, the king says Tomo's talent can help them a lot. This can change the relations between humans and demons. However, they need to be very careful so that other nations do not hear of this. They might rally up to come against them if they learn that they can communicate with demons. The king points out that their priority is to safeguard Tomoe and make sure that she is safe. Kazuya says, even Tomoe is more important than him at the moment. Kazuya tells Arx to allocate guards for Tomoe, but Marx points out that giving Tomoe a security detail will attract more suspicion. Others would want to know why a peasant girl is suddenly so important that she needs a security detail of her own. Mark says Tomoe can be adopted by Kazuya. It is legal in the kingdom, and this would help her to come and live in the castle. Tomoe protests that her families are still at the refugee camp. The king assures her that her family would also come to live in the castle. This would help to keep her safe. The king tells his officials not to let the adoption words go out just yet. Tomoe will be put in charge of the horses, and Tomo accepts the offer. Up next, the king is informed that Pancho is back from his journey. Kazuya had sent him to gather food around the kingdom. Poncho is quick to finish the task because he had the king's royal wyvern to transport him. They use the crystal cast to inform people about the king's new plan. Kazuya apologizes for the shortage of food happening in the kingdom and says plans are already underway to make things easier. However, there is now a temporary solution to make things easier. They have gathered food all over, food that they might not be accustomed to yet. Kazuya will now show them how to make some of the dishes. He started with the seafoods and showed the people how to prepare them. He adds that a panel of judges has been arranged to taste the food and see if they are edible. While preparing the food, the judges are already captivated by the smell of the food. After he is done preparing the food, 
the judges have a taste of it and immediately declare it edible and delicious to eat. The people start talking about how to make the sea creatures that they have caught into delicious meals just like the one Kazuya just prepared. Kazuya also brings out tree roots and starts to prepare them. He added salt, sugar, and other ingredients to make the roots very delicious. Poncho then reveals a dish of bean-boiled giant locusts. The judges have a taste of this too, and can't seem to get enough of it. Next up on the meal set is the slime dish. Poncho explains how he managed to come about getting a firm slime carcass without it turning to liquid. The slime had to be hit with a stick to kill the nucleus within it. This way, the slime loses its liquidity over time and grows firm. You can then cut it up to the sizes that you want. Poncho cuts the slime into noodle sizes and starts to boil it. He added several seasonings to make it more edible. After he is done, even the king is reluctant to have a taste. However, he finally tastes the slime noodles and realizes that it is even better than expected. With this, all other judges also have a taste of it. The judges all agree that the dish is perfect in every way. With this, they end the cooking episode with the king. The citizens are informed to make a request if they want another episode. A week later, Marx asks to see the king in the throne room. Accompanying Marx is Hakuya. Marx informs the king that since he was working for the former king who abdicated the throne, it feels right for him to resign also. He offers Hakuya to be his replacement because Hakuya is very knowledgeable, and he believes that Hakuya will serve the king well. Mark says the king can still hold off on his retirement benefits since the kingdom's finances are strained at the moment. The king agrees to the deal and says Hakuya's appointment will be announced later. Now that Hakuya is set to be the next prime minister, he suggests that Kazuya take some time off. Kazuya already looks exhausted already, and some time off will benefit him. Kazuya refuses, and says there are still loads of things to attend to concerning the kingdom's affairs. Hakuya then suggests that Kazuya take the day off. He can go on a date with Lysia and increase the bond together. Hakuya says the king should Aisha follow them to provide security for them. Kazuya finally agrees to this and says he can still cope with just a day. After the meeting, Kazuya finds Lysia and Aisha having a training session. The duo turns out to be formidable warriors, and with the fighting skills he is witnessing, he fears that the duo will destroy the castle if they continue. He quickly announces his presence and stops the duo from continuing their training session. He reveals his intention to go on a date with Lysia and Aisha, being their escort. Kazuya tells the duo that they need to go out under different identities because he doesn't want the people to know who is in their midst. Moments later, the trio comes out dressed like military academy students. This will help them conceal their identities and blend into the environment much better. Kazuya also tells them to call him by his second name and not address him formally. They soon get to the castle town and start having a tour of the area. They soon get hungry and Kazuya suggests that they visit the cafe where Juna works so that they can get something to eat. Upon getting to the cafe, Kazuya quickly says some coded words to let Juna know that they are undercover. Juna immediately catches on that the king doesn't want people to know that he is around, and she addresses him by his second name also. Juna serves them the slime noodles and reveals that people have been asking for it since they made a broadcast about it. This has also been an effective way to make a dish that is not expensive. All these will serve as an option till the shortage of food is finally a thing of the past. It is also revealed that the people have been demanding another episode of Cooking with the King. While the trio is talking about the affairs of the kingdom, Lysia points out that there is nothing wrong for Kazuya to marry more than one wife. She says she can tolerate a maximum of eight wives. Turns out that eight days make a week in the fantasy world, as long as she can have Kazuya for herself once a week. She then reveals that her mother was the daughter of the previous king. Her father became the king when he married her mother. Her father decided not to marry another wife in a bid to honor her mother. Kazuya is surprised that Albert abdicated the throne, even though he only married into the royal family. Licia lets Kazuya know that Albert would wouldn't have done that if he didn't have her mother's approval also. Let's have a quick review of Elfrieden's military strength before we continue. The navy is led by Duchess XL Walter, numbering 10,000. The army is led by Duke Georg Carmine, numbering 40,000. The air force, led by Duke Castor Vargas, numbering 1,000. The air force is the smallest in number, but it is said that one wyvern knight is equal to 100 foot soldiers. Furthermore, the Forbidden Army is comprised of the Royal Guard, which reports directly to the king. However, there are some mercenary armies that worked for the kingdom, but Kazuya has terminated their contracts because an army motivated by money can always switch sides when another party comes with a better offer. However, the Forbidden Army is smaller than the other three dukedom forces. This is because the kingdom was originally formed when various races decided to come together. Humans were the most populous among them, 
so one was chosen to be the king. But in order to maintain balance, the dukes were chosen among other peoples. If a king is to ever go tyrant, the other dukedoms will easily come together and defeat him. This has been the reason the dukes have chosen to not respect Kazuya's call when he requested to see them. Back in the story, the group is still having marital conversations when they overheard a boy and a girl talking at the next table. With the girl's appearance, it is figured out that she is a mystic fox. Kazuya is warned not to mistake a mystic fox for a mystic wolf because they might get angry at him. Lycia says the boy the girl is talking to is Halbert Magna, and he is the oldest heir to the prestigious Magna family. He is an outstanding horseman in the army. Juna reveals that the girl's name is Katie Foxia, and she is a regular customer in the cafe. She is said to be a mage in the Forbidden Army. The group hears the two having an argument about who to support. Albert says the Dukes might be planning to go against the king because they don't like him, and he plans to join Carmine. Tidy warns him that going against the king is a bad idea. She points out that their neighboring country, the Principality of Amadonia, might be the one fueling all these internal troubles. She adds that Amadonia stands to benefit the most if a civil war is to happen in the country. Meanwhile, Hakuya has already briefed Kazuya about the situations of their surrounding nations and those that might want to exploit them. Hakuya already told Kazuya that Amadonia is likely the one to want their downfall. Amadonia already took some of their lands some time back. Their best chance is to turn the dukes against the king so that an internal war can break out. This will help them to invade easily and claim more land for themselves. Hearing Kaide scold Halbert interests Kazuya and he moves closer to the duo. Kaide immediately recognizes the king, and fear grips her that Halbert will be arrested. The duo is invited to the palace, where Kaide reveals everything going on. She begs the king to forgive Halbert because he is still young and doesn't know what is right from wrong. He only wants to prove himself. Kaide informs the king that she and Halbert are childhood friends. Kazuya then advises Halbert not to go against his friend. If war should break out, Halbert will be forced to fight Kaede. This is because Kaede is in the Forbidden Army, while Halbert is in the army. Kazuya lets Halbert know that his friend might be in danger if a war breaks out. After hearing all these, Halbert starts to think about the decision he has made. After the meeting with the two friends, Kazuya and Lycia have an alone time out in the field. Kazuya reveals that he will only marry out of love. Lycia asks if Kazuya loves her, but he doesn't give a definite answer yet. Later on, Kazuya reveals that he can use his magic to control more than three of his autonomous consciousnesses. He has transferred one of his consciousness into a mascot outfit that does things based on his thoughts. Shortly afterward, Halbert's father Glaive requests a meeting with the king. Kazuya meets with him in the throne room. Glaive apologizes on behalf of his son and reveals that he has scolded him for his rebellious act. Kazuya accepts the apology. Kazuya then tells Kaede that he is transferring her to the royal guard as a staff officer with immediate effect. Kazuya also withdraws Halbert from the army and transfers him to the Forbidden Army to replace Kate. He is to help and support Kate. Just then, Glaive tells the king that there is something he needs to tell him that no one else must hear about. Kazuya clears the room while Aisha stands guard at the door. It is revealed that, in the fantasy world, there are six elements. Fire, water, earth, wind, light, and darkness. Each has its own unique skills. Darkness element doesn't necessarily signifies darkness, but any unspecialized magic that doesn't come under the first five elements is regarded as darkness. When being recruited into the military, each elemental magic goes to the appropriate channels. Wing goes to the Air Force, fire goes to the Army, water goes to the Navy, while Earth goes to the Forbidden Army that reports directly to the King. Light elementals are the medics and they are assigned to each branch of the military. Kazuya's living poltergeist magic is grouped under the darkness elemental. Later on, Kazuya sends the poltergeist mascot to the Adventurers Guild. The mascot joins the adventurers and helps them to complete their quests. Kazuya reveals that he had the mascot join the adventurers so he can see what the underground passageways look like. Days later, Kazuya calls his officials to the throne room and thanks them for a job well done. He says they have done a lot and have managed to secure the funding for their new project, Venetanova. He grants the officials some days off to rest and rejuvenate. When Lycia asks him what Venetanova is, Kazuya says, Venetanova is the name of the new city that they are planning to build on the coast. He has no intention of venturing into Duchess Excel Walter's jurisdiction, he plans to build the city and build roads that connect it to the rest of the kingdom. This is to reduce the shortage of food through easier transportation. He plans to make the city the heart of the kingdom. After this, Kazuya decides to take a nap because he is exhausted too. While he is sleeping, Lycia goes close to him and says, Kazuya is the only person he wants. Up next, 
Kazuya, Lishia, and Aisha take a trip to the new site for the proposed city. Construction has already begun on the site, and Ludwin invites the trio. Ludwin then tells Kazuya that they have run into a problem. There are some people opposing the construction going on. Ludwin says there are some villagers a little farther inland from the site that is led by an old man. The villagers are against building the city on the proposed site. The villagers believe that there is a kaijin living in the waters that come out to destroy anything and everything built close to the shoreline. The kaijins are said to be the beasts of the sea and building anything on the shoreline will incur their wrath. Ludwin believes that the Kaijins is a myth because no one has actually seen one. Kazuya decides that he needs to see the old man and talk to him. The old man explains everything to the king. Kazuya brings out a map and asks him to point out where Kaijin's sacred land reaches. After marking it on the map, Kazuya realizes that there is no such thing as a kaijin. Kazuya says the tsunami has been responsible for the destruction of infrastructures that have been built on the shoreline. Kazuya decides to move the construction site to a much higher ground and reinforce the foundation in case a tsunami comes in the future. Kazuya plans to ask the Forbidden Army's Earth Magic Mages to make the construction their priority. While he is carving out plans for the construction, Licia and Aisha realize that Kazuya actually cares a lot about the kingdom. They agree to always do what will make Kazuya happy. Soon afterward, Halbert and others from the Forbidden Army are tasked with helping with the construction. After work, they are served delicious dishes to help them get their energy back. The king has also urged them to take a nap after work to help them replenish their energy easily. Kazuya visits the construction site. Halbert greets him formally, but Kazuya reprimands him. Kazuya says Halbert should call him by his name and take away the formal greetings. Kazuya has been looking for someone of his age to talk to freely, and now he has Halbert. Roads are already being constructed from the site that will link to other towns. They are using concrete to make the roads so that they will last much longer. Later on, Kazuya reveals that a special type of tree called the warding tree has been planted around the area to limit the interaction of wild animals. This will prevent wild animals from storming into people's farms and eating their crops. Just then, a messenger bird arrives to give Aisha a message. Aisha reads the note and gets heartbroken. She reveals that a landslide has happened in her home forest and it has swallowed up half of the village. It is also reported that many people are missing because of the disaster. Immediately, Kazuya tells Kaide to mobilize the forbidden army men that are working on the roads for a rescue mission. He tells Lysia to go to the capital and come to the village with relief supplies. It is going to take at least half a day to get to the home forest, even with a fast horse. Kazuya needed something to transport him and the forbidden army to the village quickly. He knows that Lysia will arrive later than them, but they would have rescued some people and reduced the death toll. Kazuya makes use of a giant ox to drag the chariot and transport them to the elven village. They soon arrive at the village and are welcomed by Aisha's father, Wodan, who is also the village chief. Wodan explains the situation to the king. He says they already have over a hundred citizens dead already. Most are still missing and unaccounted for. Kazuya urges his detail to get on a search and rescue mission immediately. He also transfers his consciousness into a mouse carved from wood. The wooden mouse helps to locate trapped elves so that they can be rescued. Soon afterward, all the missing are accounted for, and most of them are already dead before they are found. However, Wodan thanks Kazuya that if he hadn't rushed over to help them, the number of deaths would have been far greater. Woden's brother, Rob Thor breaks down in tears and starts blaming the forest, but his brother cautions him. It is revealed that Rob Thor's wife died in the landslide, and his daughter is also in a coma. Woden urges him to mourn his wife and pray for his daughter to return to the land of the living. Later on, Aisha says the landslide might have happened because they didn't thin the forest, but Kazuya says the possibility is low. However, this doesn't stop them from thinning the forest now that the disaster has occurred. This is to prevent further disasters in the future. Kazuya adds that humans cannot control nature, but we can only try our best to keep it in a position that suits us. While returning back to the capital, Kazuya laments inside the carriage. He says the disaster was his fault. A ruler's job is to prevent disasters like this, and he failed. He points out that he had been so focused on the food shortage that he didn't bother to take a look at other sectors. Kazuya plans to position medical reliefs in all corners of the kingdom in case of something like this. The medics would come in handy and help to rescue people a lot faster. Up next, Juna receives information that Kazuya is not getting enough sleep and decides to visit him in his chambers. Kazuya accepts that he is tired and exhausted, but can't sleep because there are still lots of things that he needs to attend to. Juna makes him lie on the bed and pets him to sleep. As he sleeps, Juna assures him that she will always be there to conceal his weakness. Elsewhere, 
Carmine, Walter, and Vargas are having a meeting about whether to support the king or not. Carmine puts it out that he will never support Kazuya because he has the belief that he is not up to the task of ruling the kingdom. He adds that Kazuya must have tricked Albert into abdicating the throne for him. Walter tries to talk sense into the other two dukes that the neighboring countries might use this to invade their lands. Carmine is angry that since Kazuya came to power, he has gotten rid of all the corrupt ministers and officials. Carmine is confident that once they have the support of such officials, they are bound to win against Kazuya. Castor Vargas also supports Carmine and reveals his interest in getting Kazuya off the throne and reinstating Albert. Castor's daughter, Carla, enters the room and reveals that she is ready to support any decision her father makes. She believes that her friend, Licia, is also under Kazuya's spell. Now in the capital of Amadonia, known as Van, their ruler, Gaius, has gotten reports that Carmine is ready to take a stand against the king. This excites him and puts out his plan to invade once the civil war starts. He has plans to reclaim the land that he says once belonged to Amadonia. He also mocks Carmine for getting old because he should have seen through his plan if he was still in his prime. On the other hand, Gaius's daughter, Roroa, has no interest in politics or anything that goes on in the kingdom. However, she secretly keeps a tab on each kingdom to know their weaknesses and strengths. Soon afterward, Hakuya gives Kazuya the report that they should be expecting a good harvest this year. This will reduce the shortage of food in the kingdom. Back in Amadonia, Gaius has already assembled his army and is preparing to march against Elfrieden. Their first target is the border town Altamura. Amidonia's finance minister Colbert shows up to the throne room and begs Gaius not to go to war just yet. He claims that the war will result in a shortage of food and this might affect the economy. Colbert also adds that Gaius should not forget the treaty the countries signed when the demons attack. It has been put in writing that no country should go to war against each other until they have successfully defeated the demon lord. The treaty is known as the Mankind Declaration. Gaius points out that Kazuya did not sign the treaty when he came into power, and as such, he gets a free pass into attacking Elfrieden. Gaius Colbert up and sends him out of the throne room. Before sending him away, Gaius lets him know that he is fired already. After leaving the palace, Roroa finds Colbert and asks him to follow her because they have things to attend to. Up next, Kazuya calls a meeting with the two dukes. He asks for their support, and Walter agrees to stand with him. However, Carmine and Castor refuse and say they are ready to go to war with the king. Kazuya reveals his plan to centralize the military because other countries might want to exploit them. But this makes the two dukes even more angry, seeing that the other two are not ready to support him. Kazuya declares war on them too. He reveals that he will take their forces under his commands once he defeats them, and the dukes accept. After Castor and Carmine have left the meeting, it is revealed that Juna is Walter's granddaughter, and she was the one who convinced Walter into supporting Kazuya. Kazuya assures her that the new city he is building will not affect Lagoon City. Lagoon City will still be the kingdom's naval port. Venetanova will be just a distribution center and a tourist attraction center. Soon afterward, reports soon reach Kazuya that Gaius has mobilized his army of 30,000 and has started to march against Elfrieden. Gaius and his army make it to Altamura, but one of the town's representatives, West, comes outside to meet Gaius. He begs Gaius not to invade the town just yet and gives him little time to convince everyone in the town to surrender. He says there is still division in the town, whether to surrender or not. Gaius's son, Julius lets his father know that it will be best for the town to surrender on their own. This will prevent casualties on their front and preserve the full strength of their army. Gaius agrees to this and gives the representative time to convince his kinsmen. On the other hand, the Forbidden Army has erected a fort close to Carmine's territory and is engaging Carmine's army. The army brings out cannon to break down the fort, but an elf, Sir, arrives to provide support. He reveals that he has come to show his gratitude for the help they rendered when his people suffered because of the landslide. Sir helps to take care of the cannons, and this gives the royal guard the chance to advance and defeat the army outside the fort. When Carmine and the corrupt ministers hear about their defeat at the fort, they are devastated, but Cramine assures the officials and ministers that they will still turn out victorious in the war because their army of 40,000 surpasses the forbidden army of 10,000. Later on, Gaius and his army are about to attack Altamura when the representative shows up again. He begs for more time and drops some piles of gold bricks and gold dust in the meantime. He tells Gaius to attack the town if he doesn't hear from him when it is noon the next day. Gaius accepts the offer and says the stronghold will be taken by force the next day if they have not surrendered. Upon returning to the stronghold, it is revealed that Weist is actually working for Walter 
Walter provided the gold used in negotiations. Weist says the gold could have been used to hire mercenaries, but Walter says mercenaries are quick to switch sides. Walter says all they need to do is delay the invasion till Kazuya is done with his plan. Now at the fort, Air Force arrives to help the Forbidden Army, and this shocks Halbert and KD to know how the Air Force is finally helping the Forbidden Army. The story goes back to the day before. Kazuya has invaded Red Dragon City with the battleship known as Albert. He puts wheels on the ship and starts to drag it inland toward the Red Dragon City. As he attacks the city with the battleship, Castor sends his daughter and the Flying Knights to take care of the ship. After knocking over the ship, Carla realizes that the ship was being controlled by one of Kazuya's living consciousnesses. Carla immediately realizes that Kazuya's plan was to lure them out so that Castor would be vulnerable. Turns out that only Castor is left inside the castle. Castor soon finds himself surrounded by Kazuya and Ko. Turns out that Kazuya and his personnel use the secret entrance to the city to find their way into Castor's chambers. Castor realizes that he is surrounded already and seems he is defeated already. He tells them that his right-hand man, Tolman, has nothing to do with his own defiance. He asks Kazuya to make Tolman the general of the Air Force. Tolman is a diligent man and he will serve you well. These are Castor's words to Kazuya. However, Castor is not going down just easily. He tries to attack Kazuya, but Aisha steps in to fight him. Lycia also supports Aisha, and the duo easily defeats Castor. Castor concedes his defeat, and a slave collar that answers only to Kazuya is placed around his neck. If Castor tries to do anything that goes against Kazuya's wishes, the collar will tighten itself and decapitate Castor. Just then, Carla storms in and tries to fight but Castor stops her. He lets her know that they have been defeated already and there is no need to resist again. A slave collar is also placed around Carla's neck to make her submissive. Kazuya immediately appoints Tolman as Castor's replacement and gives him his orders. This brings us up to speed on how the Air Force came to help the Forbidden Army. With this, Carmine realizes that they have lost the battle already. The corrupt officials offer to use the civilians as body shields to stop the Forbidden Army's advancement. However, Carmine is against the idea, and he has his assistant put a slave collar around the official's neck. Carmine prepares himself to be healed or punished by Kazuya, but is surprised when he hears that the army is moving away from the city without entering. Unknown to him, Glaive already informed Kazuya about Carmine's plan that day at the palace. Glaive reveals that Carmine has taken all the corrupt officials under his wing. He has pretended to be on their side so they can put all their resources into his army. He already has a plan to take care of them using one stone. However, he only decided not to inform Kazuya so that none of his risky plans or tactics will be leaked. With this, Carmine has successfully taken all the corrupt nobleman's assets and left them bare. When Kazuya informs Carla about this, she was devastated. She laments that her father had supported Carmine and rebelled against the king without knowing that he had a secret plan. Kazuya commiserates with her, and says, Carmine didn't want the plan to get out, and this is the reason he didn't inform anyone else. Only Carmine's assistant and Glaive knew about the plan. Carla is fearful that the king will terminate her, but Kazuya lets it out that he has no such plan. Now, at Altamura, Gaius has grown impatient and is about to launch an attack against the stronghold, when a broadcast from Kazuya starts to play. Kazuya informs everyone that the civil war has ended and Gaius's plans have failed. He promises to deal with Gaius for trying to invade Elfrieden. Kazuya reveals that his army is on the way to take over Van as he speaks. Upon hearing this, Gaius turns his army around and starts to rush back to the capital. However, they are ambushed by Juna and a group of elite forces at a certain valley. This caused Gaius's army to suffer a great number of casualties. The army is reduced from 30,000 men to an exhausted 15,000 men. However, Gaius and the rest of his army manage to make it to Van, but they find out that Kazuya and his forces have made it to Van before them. Gaius and his army continued their advance. Ludwin, Aisha, and Lycia lead Elfrieden's army to battle against Gaius. As the fight enrages, Kazuya starts thinking about the possibility that they might lose the battle. He tells Carla that he is willing to sacrifice himself to save his men. On the other hand, Gaius realizes that the battle is lost already. He tells his son to take some of the troops with him and escape while he still can. Gaius says the future and survival of their family now lie on his son. Gaius takes some of his elite knights and charges directly toward the camp where Kazuya is staying. Ludwin cuts the knight off and eliminates all of them. He then finds out that Gaius is not among them. Meanwhile, Gaius has secretly sneaked into the camp to kill Kazuya. 
but he is met with resistance when Carla shows up. Kazuya uses his created mascot to help Carla defeat Gaius after an intense battle. Kazuya accepts that Gaius fought like a brave man, and his name will be remembered in history. With this, Elfrieden wins the battle. Roroa receives the report that her father is dead and sheds sorrowful tears. Up next, Kazuya takes charge of the capital and informs his officials that they are not aiming to conquer all of Amidonia. They just need to occupy Van, which is the capital. After making a full assessment of Amidonia's resources, Kazuya realizes that they are somewhat wealthy. He aims to sell all their military assets to raise funds. He also makes plans to bring in food from Elfrieden in case a shortage of food arises. Kazuya also tells his friends not to celebrate just yet because the Empire will want to go against them. Even though Amidonia started the war, the Empire would still want to punish Elfrieden for her participation. Kazuya notices that the people living in the city feel indifferent toward him and his people. He thinks of a way to handle the situation and win the people over. Kazuya organizes a news edition for the whole city to watch. He and Aisha also sing at the program to try and cheer people up. Juna takes the singing stage after Kazuya and Aisha, and she delivers a nice song that makes the people happy. Finally, Kazuya invites one of Amidonia's generals, Margarita Wander, to come and perform. Margarita gets to the stage and sings Amidonia's national anthem. After she is done, she already has the belief that Kazuya will terminate her, but Kazuya surprises her. He says the people are free to sing whatever national anthem of their choice and they won't be punished for it. This furthermore lifts the citizens' spirits and dejected souls. We get to see an overview of the Empire. They are responsible for maintaining order in the continent. The ruler of the Empire is Maria Euphoria, and she is known as the Saint of the Empire. Maria's sister, Jian, enters her sister's chambers to inform her that she is ready to depart to Van. They needed to make a stand even though Amidonia was in the wrong. She is going there to negotiate the return of Van back to Amidonia. Now that the citizens of Van are in high spirits, everything has gone back to normal. Roroa visits the city and realizes that everyone is going about their business. The people are happy because they now have freedom and taxes have been cut down. Roroa tells Colbert that it will be hard for anyone to come and turn the people against Kazuya. They will revolt against anyone that tries it because they are already used to the comfortable life Kazuya has given them. However, Roroa still has the intention of punishing Kazuya for his father's death. Later on, Kazuya is informed that an army of 50,000 is already coming from the Empire. It might take long for the army to arrive, but the advance team consisting of Jean will get there earlier than the main army. Kazuya tells his officials to keep him updated about the Empire. Shortly afterward, Poncho shows Kazuya a flower known as the Beguiling Lily. The flower's pollen has a powerful hallucinatory effect if it is inhaled. Someone tends to become a sleepwalker if you inhale it. Kazuya gets scared but Poncho assures him that the pollen has been removed already. The important thing Poncho wants to show Kazuya is the lily's bulb. It is used to make a delicious dish. Orangutans are tasked to help remove the bulb from the flower. Poncho makes a dish with the bulb and serves it to the people, and they all love it. Later on, Kazuya takes Aisha and Tomoe to a store to get them presents. However, the trio are wearing disguises to prevent people from finding out who they are. During the conversation with the store owner, Kazuya learns that someone as brilliant as him visited the store a few days ago. Turns out that the person in question is Princess Roroa. After buying gifts for all of his friends, they leave the store. Kazuya, Aisha, and Tomoe are relaxing under a tree when Jean suddenly shows up. She has managed to sneak into the city without being seen. Jean reveals her plan to size out Kazuya and his friends so that she will know who she is up against. She accepts that Kazuya is a master tactician, and she appreciates his approach to things. Jean says her sister would have loved to meet Kazuya. Kazuya also returns the flattery and apologizes for not signing the Mankind Declaration, even though the Empire's aim is to keep the continent safe. After a brief conversation, Kazuya lets Janna know that he is not ready to hand over Van. Janna realizes that Kazuya is stubborn and reveals that everything will have to end in a negotiation. As Jean leaves, Kazuya thinks to himself that he needs to be well prepared because the coming negotiations might be difficult. Upon getting home, Kazuya gives everyone what he has bought for them. Licia is happy to see the expensive necklace that Kazuya bought for her. Kazuya makes a determination within himself to protect those he loves and continue to move the kingdom forward. The epic battle between the kingdoms of Elfrieden and the Principality of Amidonia had come to an end. 
A time of peace is here, but there is every possibility that it won't last long. This is because the army of the Grand Chaos Empire, the greatest power in the continent, is about to make its way into Van, which is currently occupied by Kazuya Suma and the Kingdom of Elfrieden. In Elfrieden, we see Albert and his wife, Alicia, talking about handing over the throne to Kazuya as one of their best decisions. Kazuya had made a lot of changes since he assumed power, and even their daughter Lucia is happy. Up next, Kazuya is having a training session with Aisha and Lycia. Kazuya asks if someone can perform magic that is out of their class, but Lycia says no. Apparently, there are only three dark mages at the moment, Tomoe and Kazuya and two of the three. Lycia says her mother might be the third person because she has never seen her use her power before. It is more like she is hiding the kind of power she has. Just then, Juna arrives to inform Kazuya that Hakuya is waiting for him in his office to discuss the city's development with him. Hakuya shows Kazuya the redevelopment plans that are set to make Van even better. Kazuya instructs his prime minister to renovate the city, according to the people's wishes. They don't want to change how Van looks to avoid backlash in the future. Ludwin informs Kazuya that they have installed eight bridges over the rivers to make supply lines more efficient. Kazuya tells him to engrave their names on the bridges in case they later return Van to Julius. The bridges should be named Kazuya Suma Bridge, Lycia Bridge, Albert Bridge, Hakuya Bridge, Ludwin Bridge, Poncho Bridge, Aisha Bridge, and Juna Bridge. These names are to be engraved on the railings of the bridge. Kazuya does this to rub more salt on Julius's wounds in case the city goes back to him. Destroying the bridge by Julius would definitely come with some revolt among the people, and he won't want this. Moments later, Hakuya informs Kazuya that Jean and Prince Julius have arrived for their diplomatic meeting. Kazuya welcomes the duo into the throne room, thus signaling the start of their meeting. Julius demands that Van be returned to them because Elfrieden is currently violating the Mankind Declaration. Kazuya cuts him off and reminds him that Amadonia was the first to invade, and now that they have lost the war, Julius runs over to the Empire for help. Kazuya demands that Julius apologizes before even continuing with the meeting. Julius reluctantly apologizes, and Kazuya lets it out that he has no intention of giving Van back to Amadonia. Julius cries out that he is trying to liberate his people, but Kazuya asks if he sees any of the citizens complaining. Julius is dumbstruck because the citizens even have life more convenient for them under Kazuya than it was under Gaius. Hakuya shows Jian a list of noblemen that were manipulated by Amidonia to incite an insurrection. Kazuya lets Jean know that Amidonia was the first to break the treaty, and now Julius is crying because he and his father lost the war. Kazuya then asks Julius to leave the room while he and Jean continue the negotiations. Once Julius is gone, Jean and Kazuya formally introduce each other again. Turns out that Jean and Lycia know each other. They once met when they were kids at a political conference. Later on, the chief maid, Serena, enters to inform Kazuya that she is preparing a banquet for Julius already. This will keep him busy while Kazuya and Jean conclude all negotiations. Under the Mankind Declaration, the first article states that changes in borders among mankind due to military action are not recognized. Amidonia signed the treaty, but Elfrieden did not. Now that Amidonia has lost its capital, they have gone to appeal to the Empire for help. Kazuya and other Elfrieden officials sit down with Jine to discuss where they at. Before proceeding with the meeting, Gina lets out a piece of sensitive information. She says monsters meat is sweet. The monsters trooping out from the demon lord's domain have sometimes been killed by the empire and cooked for food. Gina says the meat is edible and delicious to eat. With this, Kazuya concludes that demons might be superior to monsters. Demons definitely do not see monsters as their equals. Kazuya says this might be like the situation of humans and animals. The monsters are the animals in the demon lord's domain. However, Kazuya says words of, this must not be out because humans might not see other beastmen like the mystic wolves as their equals again. Humans who have the intention of wiping out such species would not hesitate to start attacking them. After the officials agree that no word of it will come out, they decide to continue their meeting. Kazuya tells Jean that he can't accept the Empire's request to return Van because this might urge other nations to try invading each other too. Jean points out that if Kazuya continues to resist, she will have no choice but to report to military action. With the number of forces Jean has under her control, she could easily wipe out both Amidonia and Elfrieden without stress. Kazuya then reveals that his objective is to stop Amidonia from interfering with their affairs again. 
at the same time. Kazuya wants to make them pay for invading them. Genie then asks if Kazuya will return to the city if Amadonia pays for reparations. Kazuya agrees that Van would be returned if Amadonia pays for reparations. Hakuya tries to object to the decision. He says Van is liable to generate more wealth over time than receiving a one-time payment. Kazuya explains to Hakuya that the decision is not bad. The Empire would have achieved their just cause in seeing that Van is returned to Amadonia. Other non-member nations would see this as a warning not to invade any country because they will be made to pay reparations. Kazuya then insists the payments be made in imperial currency. Jean then asks Kazuya why he did not sign the Mankind Declaration. Because Kazuya doesn't want to lie, he chose not to give a definite answer to the question. Kazuya then proposes a bilateral alliance between El Frieden and the Empire. However, the alliance will be a secret to everyone else. Kazuya says the alliance will act as an avenue for El Frieden to help sustain the Eastern Front. Their task will be to repel any monster forces that will be aiming to push from the Eastern Front. Gina wonders how the alliance will be of benefit to El Frieden. Kazuya says the only benefit they will gain is the trust of the Empire. Another issue is communication. Since the Empire is far apart from the El Frieden Kingdom, Gina says it will be an issue to communicate easily. Kazuya lets Gina know that he already has a solution for that. He presents Gina with a simple receiver. This will allow them to communicate much more easily, even with the distance. Jean is in awe of how creative Kazuya is. Jean is so excited and begs Kazuya to come to the Empire. Jean assures Kazuya that he will be given the rank of Prime Minister at least. Hell, he can even marry Maria and become the Emperor. Licia gets defensive when she hears this, but Kazuya calms her down. Kazuya humbly rejects Jean's offer and says the Elfrieden Kingdom needs him also. To seal their alliance, Kazuya says, both countries will build embassies in each other's country. A specific number of ambassadors will also be appointed to make things much easier. With this, the two parties conclude their meeting. After leaving the state office, the parties step outside for fresh air. Jean then reveals a secret. She says they do not understand the language which the demons are speaking. However, there has been one consistent word that all the demons they have encountered usually say. The Empire's researchers have concluded that this word might be the demon's lord's name. Jean says the word is Divalroy, the demon lord. Divalroy is what the Empire is calling the ruler of the demons. Upon hearing this name, Kazuya feels lightheaded because the name sounds familiar to him. Lysia takes Kazuya to his room with the thought that he is suffering from exhaustion. The following day, Julius is informed of the agreed decision between Jean and Kazuya. When he heard that he would pay for reparations, he was furious. Hakuya informs him that Elfrieden will collect two years' worth of Amadonia's annual budget as reparations. This is a good tactic to make sure that Amadonia doesn't have enough funding to even start building his military strength, not to talk about going to war. However, the reparations can be paid over the course of ten years. Julius starts lashing out, but Jane says he has no choice unless he wants the Empire to withdraw their intervention. As collateral, Elfrieden will be taken Amadonia's gemstone cast with them. Also, all the books in the castle's library will be taken until all the payments are made. During their conversation, Julius asks if Roroa is amongst Elfrieden's captives. Kazuya is surprised because he doesn't know anyone as Roroa. Julius reveals that her sister is Roroa, and she has been missing. Kazuya assures Julius that Roroa escaped with some officials before the city was taken. Lysia points out that Julius might be watching out for a succession dispute, and that is his reason for asking about Roroa. Kazuya is surprised because if he was the one, his only objectives would be how to take care of her only sister and not worry about her becoming the ruler. After all the demands have been made, the three parties sign it into a document. Shortly afterward, Kazuya and his entourage pack things up and start to leave the city. The whole city is thrown into mourning as Kazuya and his party departs. Kazuya points out that the people are worried that they will have to go back to their old ways once Julius assumes the throne. The freedom they had under Elfrieden will no longer be there and they might also fall under a heavy tax reform. Elsewhere, Jean also makes it back to the Empire, and her sister couldn't wait to hear everything about Kazuya. Jean tells her about the alliance Kazuya proposed, and Maria accepts. Maria says Kazuya is living up to the hero that would bring about the new age through revolution, and not the hero that would defeat the demon lord. Maria can't wait to talk to Kazuya directly, because he fascinates him. Later on, 
Kazuya organizes a get-together party for the adventurers. He sends Lycia as his representative to thank them for their help during the war. The adventurers, including Yuno, were responsible for evacuating the citizens of the stronghold before the war. Kazuya's mascot is also present at the party because he is also an adventurer. Yuno offers the mascot a drink, and all the other adventurers also do the same. They believe that there is someone under the costume that is trying to hide his or her face. Surprisingly, the mascot takes the drink. After a few drinks, the mascot falls to the ground and starts suffering from drunkenness. You would start questioning why a mascot would be drunk. The soldiers enter to take the mascot away. When they get to the castle, it is revealed that Kazuya was actually under the costume. He wanted a chance to socialize and run away from all the politics for a little time. Up next, Kazuya visits Carmine in his cell. Kazuya has come to have a discussion with Carmine because Lycia holds him as a father figure too. Kazuya thanks him for the plan he had to get rid of the corrupt nobles. However, Kazuya is trying to find a way that Carmine would not suffer the same fate as the nobles. Carmine insists that he should be executed alongside the corrupt nobles because if his plan is made public, it might become a problem in the future. Kazuya is angry and aggrieved at the same time that Carmine is willing to take the secret to his grave. Kazuya says it is hard enough enough on him already. He had to execute the corrupt nobles, but Carmine is now insisting that he dies also. Carmine informs Kazuya that he already had everything planned out from the offset. He is willing to die looking like a traitor and having his name tarnished, as long as his plan works and the corrupt nobles are dealt with. Kazuya then asks Carmine if he came up with the plan all by himself. Kazuya believes that Carmine is sacrificing himself for Elfrieden's royal family, but Carmine refuses to give an answer to Kazuya's question. When the time comes, they will tell you themselves. These are Carmine's words to Kazuya. To make things easy on Carmine, Kazuya decides to give him a poisoned wine instead of a public execution. Kazuya also tells Carmine that his subordinates, including his assistant Beowulf, have requested to meet the same fate as Carmine. Carmine thanks Kazuya for his generosity. He urges him to take care of Lycia very well. Carmine drinks the wine and passes on peacefully. Kazuya leaves the room looking sad because a brave and loyal man just sacrificed himself for the future of the kingdom. Kazuya goes to Lycia's office to tell her that Carmine is dead. Lycia is sad, but she holds back tears. Later on, Hakuya and Jana are seen talking to each other with the help of the simple receiver. Jana informs Hakuya that her sister has agreed to all of Elfrieden's proposals. In fact, she is fascinated by Kazuya. Jian notices that a mountain of books is behind Hakuya, and she asks why. Hakuya tells her that the books are from Amidonia, and he is trying to copy everything inside the books before they return them. Jian is surprised that Hakuya is sorting the books all by himself. Jian offers him the post of chief librarian in the empire but Hakuya humbly rejects it. He has made up his mind to serve Kazuya till he grows old. He wants to see Kazuya succeed during his reign, and this is the reason he is supporting him with everything he has. After Hakuya ends the call with Genie, he continues going through the books. He is trying to find one about Amidonia's royal family tree. Inside one of the books, he sees an image drawn by Roroa, although he doesn't know that Roroa is the one that drew the image. It is quite obvious because the image in the book is the same gesture that Roroa usually makes with her eye. Meanwhile, Roroa and Colbert are having a conversation. Colbert says Roroa can't go outside now until everything settles down. Soon afterward, Kazuya organizes a ceremony where he grants his loyal servants rewards. He gives Glaive authority over the city of Randall, which was formerly under Carmine. He is also tasked with a portion of the army until it is reorganized into the kingdom's defense force. Aisha is granted the rank of the king's personal guardian. Woden is called forward to ask for anything he wants because he provided reinforcement during the war, even though his village was still suffering from a disaster. Woden asks that Kazuya take his daughter as his second queen. Everyone is surprised, and Kazuya himself is also surprised. Lycia urges him to accept the deal, because she is fine with it. Kazuya then agrees to take Aisha as his second queen. When Juna is called forward to be rewarded, Excel steps in to say a few words. She begs the king to take Juna as his wife, also because Juna cares for him and she wants him. The king says he can't accept it for now. Juna is the host for their everyday news and entertainment. However, he promises to take Juna as his wife once they find replacements for her. This gladens Juna and says she can't wait. Later on, Lycia visits her friend Carla in her cell. Carla begs Lycia to stop interceding on her behalf. She is ready to face the full consequences of her actions. It is revealed that Kazuya himself will oversee Carla and her father's trial. Shortly afterward, 
Kazuya, and the head of the families gather to pass judgment on Castor and his daughter. The charges brought against Castor are his refusal to accept Kazuya as his king, and also waging war against him. His offense is counted as treason, and is punishable by confiscation of properties and execution. XL stands as the lawyer for Castor and Carla. She says their loyalty to Albert blinded them, but they never had the intention to usurp the throne. Kazuya asks Castor what he has to say in his defense. Castor begs the king to put all of Carla's punishment on him and spare his daughter. However, Kazuya refuses and says Carla is as guilty as her father. The king decides to ask the head of the families how they want the duo to be judged. Piltori Saracen, the head of House Saracen, is the first to stand up. He says Castor shouldn't be executed because of this. Owen Jabana, head of the House of Jabana, also stands up to support Piltori. Owen says Castor has served the kingdom over the past couple of centuries, and he can still serve the kingdom for some centuries to come. Castor has already lost his status and honor, and there is no need for him and his daughter to be executed anymore. Hakuya puts it out that what Owen and Piltori are fighting for is to forgive traitors. Owen says Castor has been around for a very long time, and no one has the same experience as him in the kingdom. It would be unwise to execute him just like that. The king then asks what the rest of the family heed has to say. The rest of them all agree that Castor and his daughter be executed for their crime. With this, Kazuya orders that they should be killed. You would think he meant for Castor and his daughter to be killed, but that's not the case. His orders were to actually kill all the rest of the family heads that have supported the death punishment for Castor. An intelligence unit called the Black Cats, under the leadership of Kegatora, which reports directly to the king, was tasked to eliminate the nobles right there in the throne room. Kazuya tells the unit to contact the forbidden army troops that are standing outside the noblemen's houses to seize the evidence. Owen and Piltry are confused and demand to know what is happening. Kazuya says the twelve noblemen he just eliminated have ties with Amadonia, and they have been planning Elfriden's downfall. Even though the families have served the kingdom for generations, Kazuya is not ready to take a risk that will end up hurting his loved ones. This is the reason he eliminated them when he still had the chance. Owen and Piltery are the only loyal ones amongst the noblemen, and this is why their lives have been spared. After this is concluded, it is now time for Kazuya to pronounce his judgment on Castor and his daughter. Kazuya decides to spare Castor's life. However, he will be reprimanded to excel. He has also forbidden entry into the former Duchy of Vargas. He is not to contact his son, Carl, and wife, Axela. Castor is taken away so he won't hear Kazuya's judgment of his daughter. Carla's status will be reduced to that of a slave. Her owners will be the royal family, which is Kazuya and Lysia. Kazuya then secretly gives Carla an order. He tells Carla to eliminate him any day that he becomes a tyrant. If he ever even tries to go astray, Carla is to terminate him. With this, Kazuya concludes the judgments. Later on, Aisha and Lysia go to Kazuya's chambers to make him feel better. Kazuya is feeling lots of pressure because this is the first time to give an execution order. His two wives comfort him and make him feel much better. Elsewhere, Roroa is cooking up a secret plan with Colbert and Sebastian. Up next, Ludwin enters Kazuya's chambers to inform him that an acquaintance of his, known as the Mad Scientist, just did something crazy. Kazuya and Lysia follow Ludwin to where his acquaintance Genia is. They get to the middle of the forest. Ludwin takes them to a dungeon entrance that looks like a garage door. Ludwin says beneath the entrance is a research facility that is owned by the Maxwell family. Ludwin uses the entrance bell to inform Genia of his arrival so she can open the door. They get to the lower level, which is Genia's laboratory. Genia formally welcomes and greets the king and his fiance. Lysia reveals that she was once a mage in the Forbidden Army, but she was kicked out after an incident. Genia had made arrowheads loaded with seeds for fast-growing plants so that where Wherever there was a war, there would be lots of greenery. This means tree planting during wartime. However, she added enchanted light magic to the seeds to accelerate the plant's growth. She was kicked off the army when the arrows she fired into the training ground suddenly erupts into trees that covered the whole area. Genia reveals that her family has been conducting research for years now. They have started to get a vague glimpse of something. Jania calls it a natural law that is separate from magic. She says, the gemstones that they now use for receivers are originally found in dungeon caves. The gems are known as dungeon cores. They are the most important thing in the dungeon that when removed, monsters will leave the dungeon. This is always the adventurer's task. They aim to destroy a dungeon core or shut it down because they get high rewards for the core when they bring them back. Basically, 
Everything they know as gemstones now are damaged dungeon cores. All the studies that have been made are on the damaged dungeon cores. No one has ever brought back a working dungeon core. It has been unsuccessful to restart one also. Kazuya is worried that if a working dungeon core should be brought to the surface, it would attract monsters. However, Genya says the chances are low. It would be fantastic to be able to study the dungeon cores in their perfect state. These are Genya's convictions. Up next, Genia takes the group to see his latest invention, which she calls the Little Susumu Mark V. She says the Little Susumu is capable of propelling a large ship instead of the ships using the wind power of sea dragons. The machine sucks in the air and shoots it out in the opposite direction. Genia turns it on for a demonstration. However, she didn't realize that the machine was pointing backward. This causes the machine to throw them around when it is turned on. Ludwin later manages to turn it off without any of them sustaining an injury. Genia says she is using a stone known as the Cursed Ore to power the machine. However, the Cursed Ore is said to be explosive. Genya reveals that the cursed ore serves as a storage device for magic. Kazuya realizes that the ore is like a rechargeable battery. With this technology, the kingdom could make a giant leap forward. There is also a vein of the ore running under the kingdom. Kazuya realizes that it might turn into a resource war when other people find out about its usefulness. Not only can this technology make them the greatest superpower on the continent, but it can also destroy the kingdom. Kazuya figures out that Genia is now critical to the kingdom. He immediately proposes a marriage between her and Ludwin. The duo accepts the proposal, and Kazuya says the crown will pay for the wedding expenses. With this, Kazuya has successfully tied Genia to the kingdom. Ludian later reveals that the crazy thing Genia did was that she stole dragon bones. It is revealed that the dragon bones were found during the beautification of the capital Panam. Kazuya asks Genia what she wanted with the bones and why she stole them. Genia shows them a mechanical dragon he built from the dragon bones. She says she has not been able to get it to work. Kazuya transfers one of the living poltergeists inside the dragon, and it starts to move. However, Ludwin and Lysia caution him that other countries might be wary if they find out that Elfrieden has a working mechanical dragon that can be armed. Kazuya realizes this and powers down the machine. The mechanical dragon is given the name, Makadra. Kazuya says the project will be a top-secret internal matter and would be under lock till they hear from the Star Dragon Mountain Range. Kazuya tells Genia that they will build a state research lab for her, and she is free to choose the theme of the facility. Now, in Amadonia, protests have begun to erupt because of the tax levied on them. Things are now hard for the people and have resorted to protests. Julius's answer to the uprising is his decision to use military force. Later on, Serena starts to teach Carla how to go about her new way of life as a maid. Soon afterward, Kazuya receives a formal request from the people of Amadonia. They beg him to send reinforcements that will help them against their fight with the military. Since it is a formal request, Kazuya has no choice but to accept and send them reinforcements. Julius receives a report that all the heads of the towns and villages have started to ask for his abdication from the throne. They have all come together to go against Julius. Because of this, Julius takes a small force with him and flees to the empire. With the expulsion of Julius, Amadonia becomes a country without a leader. Surrounding nations, such as the Lunarian Orthodox Papal State to the north and the Republic of Turgis to the south, showed interest in invading Amadonia. However, the mercenary state Zem to the west is staying neutral. However, they sent mercenaries to the two countries for support. The Lunarian Papal State is home to the Lunarian Orthodox Church, which worships the moon's supreme being, Lunaria. The leadership of the nation is presided over by the Pope. Lunarians dispatched soldiers to the Amidonia borders when the rebellion started. On the other hand, the Republic of Turgis was a bitterly cold land. The land is usually covered in ice and snow. To them, Amadonia is ripped for invasion, but they have faced resistance from aged General Herman. However, there is no telling how long that would last. With this, Amadonia is now in a precarious position. Later on, Kazuya receives a request from the noblemen in Amadonia. They want Elfrieden to annex all of Amadonia. It is better to be united under Elfrieden than to be divided and conquered. Kazuya says there are upsides to annexing Amadonia, such as an increase in military strength and increase in resources. However, the downside is the increase in population. Kazuya points out that Elfrieden just solved her own food crisis. This will become a challenge also. In addition, the nation will now have borders with numerous countries unlike before when they only share borders with Amadonia. Putting all of these into consideration, Kazuya decides to annex Amadonia nonetheless. The other countries and nations are to be made aware of this decision also. He immediately orders Excel to send the navy to defend Amadonia in case of an attack. 
Shortly afterward, Kazuya invites Amadonia's former finance minister Colbert and General Herman to the palace. He thanks them for rallying the people together and asking for the annexation of Amadonia. Colbert presents Kazuya with all the financial documents of Amadonia, but Kazuya opts to make him the finance minister instead. Colbert is immediately appointed the finance minister of the two nations. Herman then presents the king with fine wools made in the southern region of Amidonia. While Kazuya is inspecting the wools, Roroa suddenly appears from underneath. Kazuya is surprised to see her, and when asked of her intentions, she says her plan is to marry Kazuya. Everyone in the throne room is thrown into shock when Roroa says this. Roroa says, Kazuya marrying her will give him the legitimacy of governing Amadonia. She also believes that Kazuya is the right man to lead both Amadonia and Elfriden into a prosperous era. Roroa reveals that she was the one that staged the uprising amongst her people to demand the annexation of Amadonia. To put it short, everything that happened was her doing. Roroa then makes mentions of the Lunarian Orthodox. She says the Orthodox are sure to contact Kazuya soon enough. This is because they are enemies with the Star Dragon Mountain Range and the Empire due to differences in belief. The Star Dragon worships the Mother Dragon, while the Orthodox worship the Supreme Being of the Moon. The problem they have with the Empire is the Saint title that has been given to Maria. The Orthodox Church believes that the only person that has the right to be called Saint is the Pope. However, this isn't Maria's fault because she didn't give herself the title. Her people started calling her Saint when they saw how good her rulership is. The Orthodox might want to contact Kazua and bestow upon him the title of Saint so that this will rival that of the Empire. After saying all these, and Kazuya, having seen how intelligent Roroa is, he accepts to marry her. However, he sought consent from Lycia, Aisha, and Juna before making his decision. Roroa immediately tells Kazuya some of the ways he can make the economy grow, like putting commercials on the daily news and entertainment programs. So, the engagement of Kazuya and Roroa was announced to the whole kingdom. With this annexation, the two kingdoms come together to form a united kingdom of Elfriden and Amadonia. The new kingdom is otherwise known as the Kingdom of Fridonia. Later on, Kazuya has a gemstone conference with Maria. He explained why Elfriden had to annex Amadonia after the last arrangement made by the Empire. Maria recognizes and says she sees no fault in what Kazuya did and this must have been one of the reasons Elfrieden didn't sign the Mankind Declaration in the first place. However, she tells Kazuya not to forget that their real enemy is the Demon Lord and the nations need to come together to defeat him for the survival of mankind. Kazuya also makes mentions of the Lunarian Orthodox and assures Maria that he has no interest in their authority. He is not willing to accept any offer that they bring to him. With this, the duo hopes that their friendship continues forever and they say goodbye to each other. The following morning, Licia and Aisha find Roroa in bed with Kazuya. They get jealous, but Kazuya says she must have slept in bed with him the night before because they were both exhausted. He assured the duo that nothing happened. Later on, Licia asks Kazuya when he wants to start trying for a baby, and Kazuya says soon enough. Up next, Kazuya points out that they need more educated personnel if they are to run the country smoothly. The narrator let us know that slavery is still being practiced on the continent, but the slave masters are mandated to take care of their slaves. However, there are some that are still violating the rule, and even go to the extent of working their slaves to death. The story takes us to a slave trader by the name of Ginger Camus. Camus's grandpa just died, and all the slaves have fallen to her care. It will be her choice whether to continue taking care of them, or sell them off. One of the slaves, Sandria, stands up to beg Camus. She says all the slaves are grieving the death of her grandfather, because he always took care of them unlike other slave traders. Sandria reveals that Camus' grandfather had said beforehand that Camus would not want to take over his trade. This is true, because Camus believes that she can just sell off the slaves and start another business. Sandria begs Camus to at least find a slave trader that will be good for them. With this, Camus promises to take care of them till she can find reputable slave traders that will not maltreat them. She will personally scrutinize them to know the kind of person they are. Later on, Kamua buys the slaves new clothes and wares. She then takes them to school to learn basic arithmetics and writing. Her aim is to teach the slaves how to read and write so that they can attract better buyers. However, Sandria reveals that she always knew how to read and write. In fact, she was very brilliant. Kamu asks her how she found herself to be a slave. Her father was tricked into taking a loan that he would not be able to repay, and he was forced to sell one of his daughters to save the shop and his family. That's how Sandria got to be a slave to this day. As time goes on, 
Camu begins to complain that sales are not going well, but she has hopes that soon enough, reputable buyers will come for the slaves. The following morning, noblemen storm the building to buy slaves. It is revealed that all leaders must be able to read and write to govern their territory very well. Kazuya has put forward the decree that all knights and noblemen must have a basic understanding, and this is what has pushed the men to get slaves that know how to read and write. In no time, all the slaves except Sandria are sold to the noblemen who even promised to marry the slaves if given a chance. Camu thanks Sandria for giving her the insight to add value to the slaves. It came at the right time when the king gave out the new policy. Just then, Kazuya enters the room in disguise. He offers to buy Sandria at a very high price, but Camu refuses. She reveals her plan to make Sandria her employee once she starts her new business. After saying this, Aisha and Roroa enter the room, and it dawns on Camu that the person standing in front of her is the king. Kazuya says he only came to test Camu, he has heard about her, and that she trained her slaves to add value to them. With this, the slaves are not even considered slaves again. Kazuya has been looking for a way to abolish slavery, but he needed the right way to go about it, to prevent backlash. Other slave traders have started training their slaves too. Kazuya tells Kamu that he has a plan to start a new agency called the Job Training Center, where all slaves can learn new skills. After this, they will be employed as public servants, and this will slowly eradicate the era of slavery. Kazuya has made the decision to make Kamu the director of the new agency, because she passed his test. Up next, Kazuya decides to visit the old slums. He is escorted by Owen, Lycia, and Carla. Kazuya reveals that he has already had the old slums renovated. All illegal activities have been cleared off the neighborhood. Kazuya makes mention of the fact that magic has made people take their minds off the dangerous pathogens that are harmful to them. However, there are pathogens that magic cannot take care of and this would lead to the death of anyone infected. The problem now is to get people to acknowledge that there are pathogens that they can't see. Kazuya says there is a tribe of people in the kingdom that knows about the existence of germs and microorganisms. The tribe is known as the Third Eye People. The tribe has agreed to work with Kazuya, and this comes as a surprise to Lysia because the tribe is known to shun other tribes. With their Third Eye, they can tell if something is hygienic or not. Because of their cleanliness, they have decided to do away with other tribes. However, Kazuya has made plans with them to develop antibiotics that will help in fighting infections. Just then, one of the third people, Hilda Norg, shows up. She starts to disinfect the whole area, and Kazuya tells Lysia and the rest that she has superb medical skills among her own people. Because of this, she has been called a doctor. Kazuya introduces his associates to Hilda. He asks after Hilda's partner, Brad who is also a doctor. Hilda protests jokingly that Brad is not her partner and that he has decided to oversee another task instead of following her. Kazuya reveals that he is in the area to check on the project he put Camu in charge of. Hilda is around to give free medical checkups to children in the neighborhood. The training school has plans to teach medical courses as well as other courses too. Camu reveals that the training center's attendance has gone up since it opened. After this, Kazuya reveals his plans to pay a visit outside the walls. He wants to meet with the refugees living outside the walls. Upon hearing this, Hilda says she is ready to follow him. She will take Brad with her. They soon get to the camp and Owen points out that the camp is a dirty place, but the people have a stern look on their faces. Just then, a group of slave traders try to kidnap children from the camp, but Yuno and the adventurers are around. They halted the operation, and Kazuya's associates also lent out a helping hand. Kazuya even took down one of the slave traders by himself. While the people are celebrating with the adventurers, Kazuya and his associates sneak past them to see the refugee's chief. Kazuya's plan is to solve the refugee problem. Refugees are one of the difficult problems facing society. Persecution and strife are part of the many reasons why these people have fled the land of their birth. They run to other countries in order to survive, some on foot, others by boat. Here in the kingdom of Freedonia, the problem is also the same. The refugee camp, located away from the walls of the royal capital of Parnam, is home to just under a thousand people. Humans, elves, beastmen, dwarves, and all sorts of people are gathered at the camp. Most of them are driven away from their lands by the expansion of the demon lord's domain. However, the refugees living in Freedonia are fortunate. Other refugees in other nations have been forced to do hard labor. They have been employed as cheap laborers and even exploited like slaves. Now that domestic affairs have been resolved, Kazuya has decided to resolve the refugee issue. Kazuya and his associates get to the chief's tent, and they are welcomed by the chief, Jirakoma, and his sister, Komain, 
Jirakoma thanks Kazuya for his help in taking care of the slave traders that tried to attack them. Kazuya then reveals why he is there. He starts by saying the refugees have been living on the land, without contributing anything to the economy of the kingdom. Some of the people might start to see this as unfair. The refugees enjoy everything every other citizen enjoys, without giving back to the nation. Kazuya has termed this illegal activity, and can no longer allow it to continue. Kazuya says he has come up with an offer. They can either be integrated into the nation, or they should vacate the land. Kazuya says, there is a new city, Venetanova, under construction, and he would like the refugees to occupy it. They will join in the building of the city, if they accept his offer. Jirukoma points out that most of the refugees still have the plan of returning to their homeland. This will be a big issue because those that are not ready to stay will have to be driven out. Kazuya says they need to make their decision very quickly because winter is fast approaching already. Just then, Brad enters the room to inform Hilda that one of the refugees is having issues at birth. They would have to carry out a cesarean surgery to safely remove the baby and also give the mother a chance at survival. Kazuya immediately tells Carla to fly back to the capital and get Hilda all of her equipment. Kazuya also orders that water be boiled so that it can serve as a mode of sterilization for everything they plan to use. With this, Kazuya says it will be a new dawn for the people because the child will know nothing of the people's past suffering. Moments later, they receive information that the child is a baby boy. Jirakoma then tells Kazuya that he will now be entrusting the leadership of the people to his sister. He plans to follow the people that are not to settle in the land back to their homelands. Hopefully, they will retake their homelands from the demon lord's domain one day. They will join hands with other nations to further the demons. After this, Kazuya goes inside to the baby's mother. The mother gives Kazuya the opportunity to name the baby. Kazuya names him Fuku, which translates to happiness in Japanese. Licia uses this medium to ask Kazuya when they will start making their own babies too, but he says he needs more time. Up next, Excel gathers Kazuya's four finances for marital education. She needs to teach the girls how to properly behave and also make them understand each other very well to prevent a succession crisis in the future. Excel had already conducted a private class with Kazuya before gathering the girls. After his session with the king, she had a mage put an illusion spell on him so he can divulge everything he feels about his finances. Excel will now tell each of them what the king feels about them, starting with Roroa. Kazuya likes how cheerful and friendly Roroa is. She can be a bit underhanded, but that's just part of her charm. Also, she is a whiz when it comes to finances. Kazuya is glad that she is one of his fiancés. However, Kazuya still feels bad that Roroa's father died at his hands. When Roroa hears this, she is sad and reveals that she wasn't close with her father. Moreover, they were at war, so she doesn't hold her father's death against Kazuya. She just wishes Kazuya would see that also. Now Juna. Kazuya sees her as a pretty beautiful person, and not just on the outside. She has a good heart, and always likes to see the larger picture behind things. Kazuya says she is the perfect woman, and wouldn't want to lose her. It's Aisha's turn. Everything Kazuya has to say about Aisha, is that she is very pet-like. In addition, Kazuya says Aisha is the most valiant fighter in the kingdom, and it is reassuring to have her by his side. Kazuya even says he has this urge to protect her, and Aisha falls into shock that she has failed as a bodyguard. The others pet Aisha and say she is truly adorable. When it is Lycia's turn, Excel reveals that the king has decided to tell her how he feels by himself. After this, XL decides to teach the girls various ways how to treat the king much better. Now in the Grand Chaos Empire, Jean and Maria are also having a plan to socialize slaves just like Fredonia has done. Back in Fredonia, Hakuya and Kazuya are thinking about jobs to give to the refugees that have started to move to Venetanova. Most of them are hunters and there is no place to hunt the Gulf City. Just then, Poncho enters to inform the king that he has finally made the perfect sauce for flour-based dishes. With this sauce, they can now make different dishes that go with it. Kazuya and Hakuya decide to turn over the production of the sauce to Venetanova. This will also serve as job employment for the unemployed refugees. Later on, Kazuya and Licia are having an alone time when Carla enters to inform Kazuya that Albert wants to see him. Albert has also asked that Kazuya come alone. Soon afterward, Kazuya makes his way to Albert and Elisha's chambers. Albert congratulates Kazuya on winning the war and also on the annexation of Amidonia. Kazuya has done all of these in under just eight months of his reign. He was made king in April, and now it's December. Kazuya says he has been trying to see Albert for quite some time now, but he has been avoiding him. Albert reveals that he is now ready to answer all of Kazuya's questions. Kazuya puts forward the three questions that have been bothering him. When he came into this world, 
Albert gave up his throne immediately, and even gave him his daughter to marry. Georg Carmine's decision to also be seen as a traitor, just so his plans could work, the loyalty he had till he drew his last breath. Why has Albert not seen him all these while? These are three questions that Kazuya needed answers to. Albert starts by saying, all of Kazuya's questions are linked to one single thing. Albert then tells Kazuya a story about a mediocre king. His kingdom summoned a hero, and when the king saw how brilliant the hero was, he made him the prime minister. The hero started making different reforms that helped the kingdom, but the reforms agitated the rich and powerful. The aristocracy tried to convince the king that the hero is dangerous to the kingdom. However, the king had a friend, who was the army general, and the general recognized the hero's talents. The noblemen kept pressuring the king to get rid of the hero, and alas, the king removed the hero as his prime minister. The hero then takes shelter in the city, where the army general had his castle. The king did this to at least keep the kingdom from being divided. However, that same year, a neighboring country that has always bored a grudge attacked the kingdom. The army general sent his forces to confront the enemy troops. That was when the problem started. As if they were anticipating this, the aristocrats' forces staged a revolt, and the army had to fight on two fronts. After a fierce battle, the general was slain, and the castle fell. The hero also perished in the conflict. It doesn't take long before the enemy forces surrounded the capital, and the king realized that he had brought this upon himself. When Albert said all this, Kazuya was surprised because the way he narrated was like he was there. Albert then tells Kazuya that he was shown what would happen. Turns out that Elisha's dark magic ability is to transfer memories to people in the past. When the capital was falling, the king's wife used her ability to transfer the warning to their past selves, and this was how Albert got to know what would happen. Basically what happened was a time leap. Albert then says he told Carmine about it, and he supported him without a doubt. With this, the king has given an answer to all of Kazuya's questions. Kazuya then asks if Lycia was in the castle when it fell. Albert reveals that Lycia was angry that he had fired the hero, and he went to find him in Randell Castle. When the aristocrats' forces attacked, she and the hero must have perished during the conflict. It also turns out that Kazuya never got to recruit all the people that are now very close to him in that timeline. He is able to do so in this timeline because of his engagement to Lycia. His engagement to Lycia gave him the right to use the gemstone cast, and this is how everything started turning around. It was through the cast that he had recruited almost everyone that has helped him. With this, Albert reveals that he and his wife have now decided to leave the capital and go somewhere secret to enjoy the rest of their days. He begs Kazuya to take care of Lycia, and Kazuya promises to do so. Before leaving, Kazuya tells his in-laws that Lycia and his other self might not have perished in the castle since they didn't find their bodies. It is possible that they escaped to continue living in another place. Upon getting to his chambers, Kazuya has a romantic time with Lycia. He then tells Lycia that he loves her and would like to marry her now. The duo hugs each other as fireworks go off in the background to signal the start of the new year. Later on, Kazuya gathers his friends, fiancés, and associates to thank them for always being by his side. 